So this says, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Did that strike anybody a little unusual besides me? Really? Like they're going to preach and there's a fine tuning, there's a nuance involved in what the Spirit's saying is, yeah, I want you to preach, but not there. So you're going to have to wait for further instructions. I'm only telling you where you shouldn't go. I didn't tell you where you should go yet. Anybody else find that frustrating <laughs> as a Christian? <laughs> that he didn't, well, you know, like if you want me to go somewhere, just tell me. But that's part of the interactive thing with God is that in the meantime, you got to wait. You just got to be patient because all we know so far is they can't go to Asia. And then in 7, it says after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. What does that mean? The Spirit did not permit them. Well, that they were sensitive enough to know that as they were about to step in that zone, they got a check in their heart. Now, some of us would have just kind of plowed through that and said, no, but we're going to preach the word. Almost like Abraham, I know the Lord told me to do this. And then God said, no, I did tell you to do it then, but now I'm telling you not to do it because <laughs> we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, right? So just because it was true a year ago doesn't mean it's true today. This sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> I got to keep listening. I have to stay current. I need daily bread, not yesterday's bread that is now full of worms. Oh, can't you just make it easy, God? There's war going on, right? I, I, if, if we had Navy SEALs here today, they would tell you there's nothing easy about it. But boy, aren't you glad we have the Navy SEALs protecting us and being alert and being ready to change. I don't know if you saw the movie Captain Phillips, but you know, true story. Uh, you know, an amazing amount of strategy that they had to put in place to free this guy. Uh, I'm sure glad they're on our side. <laughs> All right, so now verse 10 says, after he had seen the, oh, I'm sorry, nine, I got to go to nine. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, say it with me, go over to Macedonia and help, which is Greece, okay? Which was a pretty far distance from where they were. But now, finally, good. I, you know, Paul gets a sense. This is the Lord. And instead of just telling us where not to go, now I'm getting a vision of where I should go. Anybody relate to this? Been through a process in your life where you were seeking the Lord. It took a little time, maybe a couple of rabbit trails, but now all of a sudden, boom, clarity comes and you step into that. That's a great feeling, isn't it? It's almost like the, the launch pad, the rocket's waiting, and now all of a sudden you see that fire coming out of the bottom and the thing's about to go. This is a pretty strong crew, too, because Paul was with Silas and Timothy and Luke. So that's a pretty, that's an A team. And all they know is they're supposed to go to Greece. And it's like, okay, when you get there, then you'll get your next assignment, right? So this is that walk of faith. Like Abraham went not knowing where he was going. And a lot of us can relate to that. So after they had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. And from there to where? Anybody know anything about Philippi? It was founded by the father of Alexander the Great, who was named Philip. And this was a city where they would send uh, Roman soldiers that retired from service. So, you know, it had a lot of esteem, but again, like ruling spirits over that area. And to our knowledge, no church had been planted yet in Europe because Greece is part of Europe. So there you go. You're stepping into a whole new zone with all different kind of ruling spirits, a lot of Roman Empire influence on it, not a lot of Jewish people living there at the time. And, and here they come, not knowing completely what the assignment is other than to say, preach the gospel. All right, you all with me? You're looking healthy so far, like the coffee is working. <laughs> so what did they do when they got there? They went to prayer. Now, they had already met Lydia. I don't mean to, you know, cancel out Lydia. She's great. We'll talk about her. And um, this is right after they met her and they were praying. And and a certain slave girl possessed of a spirit with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. This she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. 
and he came out that very hour. He, by the way, spirit was a he. So I think there's a lot of us who are like, wow, I'm sure glad that doesn't happen anymore. Well, sorry. The devil does still attack people. So I really like the commentary on this next slide. I'll come back to this, but let's read this. This commentator said, and like a compass needle swinging suddenly round to point to a new and powerful magnetic force, this unfortunate young woman found herself following Paul and Silas and yelling after them, slaves of the Most High. I'm sorry, slaves of God Most High. That's what these men are. They're announcing salvation. And what a picture. You know the compass needle? Like, we don't see them too much anymore, but what is it looking for? It's, it's looking for the source of the power, and what a great way to say it, the way this commentator said it was like, they step into this zone, they're solid Christians, they're in a region that doesn't know anything about this, and there's somebody there who's being oppressed, who's like a compass needle that's attracted to the power in them. What about you? Why not? doesn't mean it's always bad, but it just means you carry a different spirit. It's just like we started with. The spirit of God is going to come on you, and you're going to be a different person, Saul. And it says he operated in power because of that. And sometimes it's like, well, I don't know. Paul is basically saying, we don't want our cover blown right now with this girl walking around. When we're ready to let people know why we're here, not unlike Nehemiah, if you know your Bible, when he went down to Jerusalem, he was just doing reconnaissance when he first got there. He was riding around the city at night. He didn't let anybody know why he was there. So all of a sudden now, this girl who's oppressed starts shouting it out, and he says, no, I don't want this. That's not the spirit that we're of. That's coming out. Now, do you think he regretted that? Some say yes, yeah, some say no. That's good. So we're going to have civilized dialogue now. <laughs> we're going to respect each other's opinions. Because, you know, at surface, when you first read it, probably as a new Christian, he's like, why? She's giving them a commercial. Why would he tell her to stop? But because you, you have to be discerning. And do you really want the devil doing your advertising campaign? <laughs> no. It's, you know, you want to be driven by the Spirit of God. So now all of a sudden things go south, it looks like. Because it says in verse 19, when her master saw that their hope for profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas. So I guess Luke and, and Timothy weren't exactly with them at that moment. They seized Paul and Silas and, and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. The magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. Is this anybody's definition of a good day at this point? I thought, God, if you love me and I'm hearing your voice and you sent me to do what I'm supposed to do, this wouldn't have happened, so this must not be God. Is that what he said? No, is that what we say? You can be honest. Yeah, sometimes we're wondering. Bad things are happening to good people and they're saying it's the Lord, but it doesn't look obvious to us that that would be the case. Now, we have the benefit of hindsight and being able to look back and know the whole story in this case, it turned out for good. But what if it's our life today, right now, and we're in the midst of a trial? It's really important that we're tied to the anchor of our soul. And it's really important that we're in a body of believers that are going to come alongside us and walk through the thing, whatever the thing is, with us for that encouragement. Because nobody can expect to be strong 100% of the time on your own. We're here to help each other to know about each other's lives and to pray for each other. And you know what? If somebody's having a bad day, they're allowed to have a bad day with you because you're their friend. And you're not going to cut them off for that. You're going to be there for them, and you're going to go back after a, uh, you know, a tough time and say, you know, I know you weren't yourself yesterday. How are you doing today? I've been praying for you. How valuable is that? Can't really put a price on it. So, we, you know, you probably know the story. They're thrown into prison, beaten and flogged. By the way, Paul is a Roman citizen. Totally illegal for them to do that. What are they doing? <laughs> About midnight, Paul and Silas are praying, singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. 
So I'd say that qualifies as mighty works, <laughs> not common, right? We're going to read that later in, you know, in, in chapter 19. But the, the obedience of God and the calling of God carries with it power that demonstrates itself in very unusual ways, don't you think? Because the idea that there'd be an earthquake that would shake the prison doors to the foundation and everybody's chains fly off, <laughs> really? Does that, you know, if you saw that scene in a movie, would you believe it? But this is God we're talking about. These are miracles. That's why they're called miracles. Mighty works, not common. An earthquake comes. I'd say if you were Paul and Silas, you'd be saying a little more confidently, maybe this really is the Lord. He was the one. That guy that I saw in the vision, it was the Lord. It wasn't, you know, a pizza dream like people talk about. It was a real vision because God is showing up now. And he's doing something so radical that there's no other explanation that, he, that this is him. And the next one we go to, to 1627, it says, When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Anybody have any insight on that part? As if you were under Roman rule, he was an officer under Rome. He knew if the prisoners escaped and the Romans came and caught him alive, they would torture him, right? So he's thinking, you know what? Before they kill me, I'm just going to kill myself because dying fast is better than being tortured by the Romans. And Paul jumps out and says, no, don't harm yourself. We're still here. The jailer called for lights and rushed in, trembling all over, fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought Paul and Silas outside and said, gentlemen, will you please tell me how I can get out of this mess? <laughs> That's a different interpretation. I know, you know, the ones that we're used to say, what must I do to be saved? But when you really look at the, at the language, it's a little more nuanced than what must I do to be saved, because we hear that in, uh, you know, in 2018, and we think it's the Roman road to salvation. But it was a little bit more pragmatic than that. It was really like, I am in a really tough bind right now. I have no idea what's going on. And if the Romans get here soon, they're going to kill me. And why didn't you run out, by the way? <laughs> you know, cognitive dissonance happening in this guy's head, the jailer. How do I get out of this mess? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be rescued and your household. And the next verse says, they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them, washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house, this is the jailer, and set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. And I'm just throwing in a little thought here. Is it possible, at least, that the jailer was the guy in the vision? Is it possible? Maybe he didn't even know it. But the way the Spirit of God operates, he sees there's a need in Greece. He sees Paul and Silas willing to be obedient and to go wherever he's saying. And now all of a sudden, this guy appears in a vision supernaturally. There's a need here. They go to the need. The jailer doesn't even know he was crying out. But there was some connection. I'm just putting it on the table for you. I'm not saying that I read that anywhere. But it dawned on me that God loves us so much. He cares about us so much that he will do mighty works, not common. He'll put you in somebody else's mind, and you don't even know it. Who knows if this jailer was crying out to God and praying, but not knowing who he was praying to. Remember the girl? She's like looking for power, and all of a sudden, boom. She's attracted to the power in this group of men and just calling it out. Slaves of the God Most High, they're here to announce salvation. Well, obviously her bosses weren't too happy about that <laughs> because now all of a sudden she couldn't be a fortune teller and she, they stopped making money. That's a big ruling spirit, don't you think? Think it's a ruling spirit in DC? New York City, Wall Street, <laughs> mammon, can't serve God and mammon. So all of this stuff is getting stirred up. Here's the deal. This was the beginning, the birthing of the church in Philippi.